usual. Welcome to Wasa Distance Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can join, you can call the Wasa Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express U channel 972. You can, are always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from me and also your D, DC. Our classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday from three till four in the afternoon. And we are wrapping up our sixth week of our nine week course. Monday is a holiday here in Ontario. So we will not be airing on Monday. So join us again on Tuesday, May 28th, sorry, 24th um, for our next class. And hope you have a lovely long weekend. All right, at this point, you should definitely be submitting work for marking if you're hoping to get your credit done this year. Uh, we only have three more weeks of our course and you need to have all of your work in by June 10th. So a reminder that the key questions are the ones with the key icon that are listed at the end of each of your IL lesson. So those are the questions you need to submit. You need to do all of them. Some of them are tech or understanding questions, some are activities, some are review questions. All of them are in your uh, workbook that comes along that we send you out um, that has your chapters that you read and then the questions that you answer. So make sure you're following along with what the assignment are in the IL lesson, but that the questions are in the workbook. Please give me full answers showing all of your thinking and your steps, how you get to your answers so that I can really understand what it is that you understand and make sure that you're actually answering the question opposed to just talking on the topic. You're welcome to do this by hand or electronically. If you'd like to write in the workbook, feel free, though the spaces are rather small. So make sure that you're still giving me full detailed answers and that I can still read it. If you want to do it electronically, you can uh, probably do it in any type of file, but Word and Google Doc files are the easiest ones for me to open. Everyone has access to Google Docs through the their NNEC email address. So if you need help accessing that, let me know and I can support you with that though probably whatever kind of file that you are generally working in i most likely will be able to open just touch base with me so i can we can make sure that i can open them so that you don't have all your work in a file that is inaccessible to me all right so then there's three ways to submit your work for marking the first is to scan your work in if you've written it out and send electronically or to send me your electronic files if you do need to scan your work you can do that using a smart device either the iPhone notes app, excuse me, or the Android Google Drive app, both have scan functions that are fairly straightforward. If you need support with that, I'm happy to support. If that doesn't work for you, you don't have access to a smart device or those apps, then um, you can take a picture, that is fine. They are generally larger files and potentially a little bit harder for me to read, but if that's what you need to do, because that's what makes the most sense for you, go for it and we'll work with it. Then you can send it to me either through email at studentwork at nnec.on.ca and then cc it to me directly, bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca, or you can send it to me through Facebook Messenger to be slate wasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our 74 Front Street location where the bright red building next to the post office, and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance that you can access at 24 hours a day. We continue to be closed to the general public. So just if you're in town and you wanna drop off work, just put it in that mailbox and then I'll get it and get it back to you as soon as I can. And then the third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can friend me on Facebook or subscribe to my YouTube channel, and then you'll get notifications every time that I upload one of our lessons. All of our classes are recorded, 
and then I post them to YouTube in a playlist called SVN3E. And then I also generally share them on Facebook so you can find them there as well. Science is a really visual subject. So I try to put in as many diagrams or pictures or videos as possible to tap into our various ways of learning. So just listening to our lessons are probably not gonna give you the full experience. So I strongly advise you to connect with the videos, either joining us live through Zoom, um, though you don't need to participate, you don't need to talk to me or ask me questions, just viewing live can work, that's totally fine. Or you can watch the replays on YouTube at your own time, um, that is also completely fine. If you don't have access to reliable internet, you can let me know and I can send you a copy of the recordings so that you still have access to that information. Just let me know. All right, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and uh, talk to me. I am trying to touch base with all my students right now, but if you haven't been sending me work or I don't haven't been able to connect with you yet, I might not know that you're actually working on the course material. So it would be great if you could reach out so that I know that you need support. My email address is bronwyn.slate, and that's spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. My Facebook is bslatewasa. My phone number is 807-737-1488, extension 2209, and I do now have access to my extension. You can also call toll-free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., though I teach the first hour and the last hour of my day, so you might not be able, you won't be able to get a hold of me at those times. All right, I believe it's important to position myself within the context of our world. As a teacher, I have a certain amount of power, and who I am gives me even more power, um, both in, as a student, as I was learning, and now as a teacher. So I think it's important to acknowledge that and talk about how I work against that. Um, I have white settler ancestry, I have white privilege, and this shapes how I have learned in this world and how people have treated me in this world and definitely has meant that I haven't faced as many barriers as many other people have. So I acknowledge that and I work towards addressing that within the way that I teach, um, hoping to not just perpetuate the cycle of white privilege within my classroom, though I definitely don't get it right all the time. And it is something that is a constant learning process that I'm constantly trying to do better. I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. So I work towards learning from this culture around me and honoring the knowledge keepers and the traditions of the, the people who originally live in this area and currently live in this area. This is my first time teaching this course, so I do have lots to learn and unlearn in relation to science and in relation to Indigenous education within science specifically. This will be a lifelong journey, I assume. Um, I don't think I'll ever have it all figured out, but I do accept uh, teachings from those around me. So if you have any suggestions on how I can be doing better or things that I'm missing, please reach out and let me know. I've also noticed our textbook is very Eurocentric. So it's very much centered around the white experience, both in terms of the scientists that it speaks about and the communities that the examples that they talk about. Um, this largely means that they're ignoring indigenous Inuit and Métis knowledges and experiences, and this is highly problematic. Therefore, I try to integrate some of the, those, the bits and pieces that I know about indigenous Inuit and Métis knowledges and experiences that I have learned about in my educational journey, um, but I definitely don't have it all figured out and I don't know everything. And so if there, again, if there's anything that I'm missing that you'd like to share with me, I'd be happy to integrate them into my course for both this, the remaining of our time, but also for future courses. All right, so we are in unit five, where we're talking about making work safe and buildings energy efficient. So we've talked about how we as humans have modified our environments, particularly with the places that we work and live, um, building buildings, 
and really changing the environmental space for our own needs. And that has means that we have responsibilities about how we are respecting and treating the environments around us and how we're treating, how we're dealing in those work environments. So this is what this unit is about. Today in particular, our lesson is number 17, where we're dealing with workplace hazards. So at the end of this lesson, you will be able to identify and describe some common workplace hazards, biological, chemical, and physical. You'll be able to describe the methods of minimizing risks in the workplace and at home. So the success criteria, you know that you've met those learning goals is because you can describe biological, chemical, and physical workplace hazards, and you can explain how to minimize risks at home and at work. So just sort of positioning us a little bit, as anyone who has spent time caring for young children, life can be full of hazards. We all know this. So unwatched babies and toddlers often put things in their mouths that can make them sick, uh, choke, or poison them. They show no fear of, of objects like cars that move or water or electricity. They behave like this because they do not suspect that these things can hurt or kill them. So people in work environments do not have parents and other caregivers to watch out for them, which is hopefully what happens for our young little people. Um, yet, as well, workplaces often hold unsuspected hazards and dangers. So we need to learn about them so that we can keep ourselves safe as well as our coworkers. So first we're gonna talk about some types of hazards. So biological hazards are those that can cause diseases. So the diseases are caused by pathogens like bacteria, viruses, single cell organisms called protozoa and fungi, which we've talked about before. One biological hazard is Listeria bacterium, which we've also talked about before. Um, this pathogen caused a deadly Listeria outbreak in Ontario in 2008. And this was at a factory, at a meat processing factory. And then made the people in the factory, people who consumed the, the meat sick, as well as I think the people in the area. And I believe that seven or eight people died um, by the time that they had it under control. So that's where it started within a workplace. Um, then also the Seminella bacterium is another common pathogen. It is found naturally in the environment and in the intestines of poultry and other animals. Improper food handling and cooking can allow it to contaminate food. People who eat such food often come down with food poisoning, which we've talked about. So work environments at risk for biological hazards include restaurants, food processing plants, dairies, farms, hospitals, veterinary clinics, pet stores, and doctor's offices. So there's many, very many places that we can come in contact with biological hazards. So there are these, um, in terms of their Ontario food premise regulation, there are three different signs that you may see on a business or organization if they have not passed the health units um, inspection. So there is the green pass one, and it might look slightly different depending on the, uh, the organization, the like municipality, if it's Toronto or if it's Northwestern Ontario, like so it's under the Northwestern Health Unit or wherever they might have, they'll have different logos and things, but generally the same thing is that we have the pass, which is going to be green, which is substantial compliance with the Ontario food premise regulations. They've passed the health inspection to make sure that there's no biological hazards that are going to risk the health of either the workers or the uh, customers. Then we have conditional pass, where it's, there's significant non-compliance with the Ontario food premises regulation. So they need to do some adjustments. They need to fix some things and they're gonna have, have another inspection um, to come to make sure that they have passed, but they haven't shut them down yet. They're giving them a chance to improve, the health inspector is. And then we have closed. So the conditions represent an immediate health hazard to the public. So this red sign that says closed means that they there's something that is going on in this workplace that is gonna make people sick. And so they need to be dealt with before they it's appropriate to reopen. So most biological hazards can be avoided. One way to do this is to keep the work environment clean, super important. 
Another way is to inspect at risk areas and operations frequently to make sure that pathogens are not present. The third way is to sterilize and pasteurize substances in which pathogens can breed. So milk and potting soil, for example, are both pasteurized to kill bad bacteria. So there's ways, there's various ways that we can deal with biological hazards by just being clean and careful to make sure that we are not being exposed to such pathogens and things that could make us sick. All right, so now we have chemical hazards. So chemical hazards are dangers posed by chemicals that have toxic or harmful effects on the body. The effects may be acute, so immediate, or chronic, which is long-term. The danger may be in the form of mists, fumes, vapors, gases, liquids, dust, or solids. So there's lots of different ways that chemicals um, can be harmful. Thousands of different chemicals are used in various kinds of workplaces. So it's all around us, something to be really uh, quite educated about so that you really know how to keep yourself safe. These chemicals may be used to process or make products or to make other chemicals. Not all chemicals are toxic and harmful, but we need to know the difference. We can't assume one way or the other. However, some can have severe and acute effects on health. So this is why it's really important to know what is what you're working with. An example, so one example is chlorine, which is a very poisonous, a very poisonous yellow green gas. And it's used to make bleaching agents for paper as well as as in household bleach. So chlorine is something that we use, but it is a really poisonous when it is in gas form. Uh, chlorine is also used to make plastic solvents and pesticides. Very low levels of chlorine are also added to drinking and bath bathing water to kill pathogens. So it's something that we even consume as we put it in our water. But again, if it's a gas, it is really, really poisonous. So by themselves, low levels pose very little risk to health and health benefits they bring are very high. So this, it can be really a good thing, but it also can be really hazardous. So negative effects from other chemicals may take years to show and be chronic. So you, sometimes you, it's not like it's an instant thing that you're just like, oh, this was a bad thing to come in contact with. It may show up later in life. An example of this is silicosis, a serious respiratory disease it is inhaled by calling, inhaling silica dust. Pure silica is mined to make fine ceramics and laboratory glass. Impure silica is also a common byproduct of many other mining operations. So something that's easy to, you need to be careful about not breathing in. So here are a list of common workplace chemicals and where they might be used and the hazard level. So. In the construction industry, we have hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and calcium hydroxide are all very common things to work in, to have in construction. And they all have high levels of hazard. So they are very dangerous. Um, but within cleaning concrete, they're used to clean concrete, to clean brick and etching glass, and to make cement. Um, so they are used frequently you just need to do it safely so then in farms and nurseries pesticides and fertilizers which we've talked about before are chemicals that are often used uh, pesticides have a high hazard level though fertilizers have a low to medium level uh, pesticides are for controlling disease so it makes sense why they'd have a high hazard level because their purpose is solely to um, kill things Whereas fertilizers are help to boosting plant growth. So not as hazardous. Within the health services and veterinary clinics, there are drugs and sterilizing agents. Both are very high in terms of hazard level as drugs are for treating diseases and the sterilizing agents are for killing pathogens. Both are really about, will affect your body significantly. Your resource extraction, so this is like mining or drilling or logging, taking resources out of the earth. Um, so we need to, to use that. They use explosives and fuels. Explosive has a high hazardous level and fuels are medium to high level. So for explosives, this is for like breaking rock or log jams. 
fuels for vehicles, heating fuels that we use all the time, as we know. And then finally, manufacturing is the industry and they use sulfuric acid, solvents and petrochemicals. So sulfuric acid has a high hazard level and it's for cleaning metals. Solvents has a low to high, so a really range depending on the situation, how much you're using and the, how, uh, can't think of the world, how strong it is. Um, so this is for cleaning or making solutions. And petrochemicals also has a low to high, again, depending on how strong it is um, for plastics, oils, paints, and dyes. So various things that we do that are very, or that we rely on fairly frequently has various hazardous levels, um, lots high hazardous levels for the people who are working in those industries. So hazard chemical, sorry, chemical hazards can be minimized with proper care and training. Staff should be thoroughly trained in the safe use and disposal of the chemicals. The chemicals should only be kept in approved containers. These should be clearly labeled as to the contents, the dangers, and first aid procedures. A chemical should be locked in safe storage cabinets when not in use, and only a few trusted people should have access to the keys to those cabinets. When no longer needed or after their expiry date, the chemicals should be disposed of according to local, provincial, and federal, federal regulations. Another option is to employ a licensed chemical disposal handler. So chemicals, as we saw, are used in lots of different workplaces and are important for various things that we, we use. And so it can be, they can be used safely. They just, you just need to be trained appropriately. So if you are working in an environment that has, you're using chemicals to some degree, however it is, you need to be trained how to do it safely. That's super, super important to be trained how to use the tools that you're using safely. All right, and then we have physical hazards. So physical hazards are those that pose a direct threat to your body. Most work environments, even offices, present one or more physical hazards. These hazards may not look dangerous. For example, a wet floor, a loose carpet, a misplaced chair, all present physical hazards that can cause serious injury. Some environments present um, many physical hazards, those that involve working at heights or with heavy loads or sharp objects or with high noise or vibration levels are some examples that have various uh, physical hazards. So many of these environments involve factory or outdoor work. So there's lots of different places. Many of us, pretty much if you're in a workplace, there's gonna be some sort of physical hazard. Some to the more extreme, if you are working on a hydro truck and you're going up in the bucket and working in electrical lines, that's one kind of, you know, there's various hazards there. Or if you're working in a train yard, that's gonna have different hazards. Or if you're working in a school, um, there's different hazards there. So it really depends on your environment and what you need to be cautious of. So factory tasks, farming and fishing often involve working with heavy loads and powerful machines. Fishing carries the added risk of working on wet, slippery and shifting surfaces in all sorts of weather. Working on airport tarmacs may mean exposure to high noise levels with every takeoff. Most construction jobs present a variety of physical hazards, including noise. The dangers of physical hazards can be minimized with proper safety training and equipment. Again, training is super, super important. Equipment is super and super important. We can deal with these things, but we just need to have proper training and safety equipment. Trainers must inform staff about all known hazards. They must show them how to best protect themselves or to use safety equipment. They must also check to be certain that workers are following proper safety procedures. So it's partially on the responsibility of the employer to make sure that you are trained as a worker to be safe. And that it's the responsibility is also on the worker to be safe and also to uh, you can also refuse work if it is not safe. That is the law. You don't have to do unsafe work. You have a right to refuse it. Um, and that's really important to know. All right, so now you can do the key questions on page 138, the check your understanding questions. They are one and two. Okay, so we know what the hazards are to be, are some of the hazards. We can't, we don't list every single one, but the idea is what the hazards are. So how do we minimize the risk? So the best protection about hazards is a proper attitude. 
This means that every employee puts safety first in mind and refuses to allow others to behave in unsafe ways. So it's really important to, we can have all the rules in place, we can have all the materials and the safety gear, but if people aren't following the rules, if people are not caring about safety, if they just kind of, have, oh, nothing's gonna happen to me, um, that doesn't matter what any of the policies or procedures are, people are still gonna get hurt. People are still gonna get sick. So it's really about everybody believing that safety is important. That's what our best defense is. So one particular strategy, so beyond this, what are the things that we can do beyond having a positive attitude and a safe attitude? So we have mapping the hazard location. So knowing where the hazards are in your workplace. So protection begins with knowing which hazards are where in the workplace. A good way to record this information is to make a map of each work site. Locations of all hazards are then plotted on the map along with input from employees. Abbreviations or numbers are used to identify each hazard type and its risks. These are listed in a key and or legend on the map so that we know what we're talking about. So here is one example of a building as a hazard map. So we can just look at it and we can say, okay, here is the front desk. There's elevators, a storage room, fuse box, more storage room, office rooms, stairwell. So we have a codes. So we have indoor air quality um, in the public spaces, being aware that it's potentially lower indoor air quality. We have chemical agents stored in the storage rooms, CA. We have biological hazards in the storage room, in this back storage room. We have physical hazards in the fuse box, in the elevator, on the stairs. So those are all just gives you a general idea of what to be concerned about um, and what you don't need to be concerned about. So that can be really helpful in each of your environments. I don't think I've ever worked in a, in a place that has a map like this or has shows me a map like this so maybe there is something but it isn't something that i've seen as an as a worker um i have not worked in as a teacher i've most of my life i've worked in schools um so it might be slightly different if you're working on a construction site or in something that is a little bit more labor intensive i don't know it's an interesting idea i don't know if it's ever if people actually implement it so another method of keeping people safe is knowing the material hazards. So by law, most materials that pose health and safety hazards must bear standard symbols that identify their risks. Two sets of symbols are chiefly used for this purpose. All people who use are exposed to hazardous materials should know what these symbols mean. They should know and follow proper safety procedures when working with these materials. In case of an accident, they should know how to administer first aid specific to them. They should also understand spilling these materials on soil or in water or releasing them into the air may also call, cause harm to the environment at large. So the first system is the hazardous household product symbols. So the hazardous household product symbols or HHPS are used to alert people to the hazardous, hazards of consumer products like oven cleaner. So each symbol consists of one of four icons enclosed in either an inverted triangle or an octagon or diamond even. The inverted triangle means that the container holding the product may ex explode if heated or punctured. And the octagon means that the product inside the container is dangerous. So the hazard level, really, it can be at multiple, this is what your textbook says, but this is, there's multiple levels. So the octagon, the stop sign is stop. This is really, really dangerous. The diamond is warning not as dangerous, but still concerning. And the triangle is cautious. Um, as a math teacher, it drives me nuts. They say inverted triangle in your textbook because a triangle is a triangle. There's no up or down to a triangle. Um, but anyway, a triangle with the, generally it is situated such that the flat side is at the top and the point is at the bottom. Okay, so let's look at what these um, signs are. They can, a product can have more than one. It can have one up to four of the, all four of these signs on it. 
depending on what the product is. So first we have corrosive. So the corrosive symbol is a, looks kind of like a skeletal hand inside a beaker. The beaker is generally black, or if the symbol is a color, it might be red or something. Um, the same color as what the sign is. And then the hand is generally white because um, it's skeletal. So, and so again, danger in an octagon, warning in a diamond and caution in a triangle. So what corrosive is means is that it can burn skin, eyes, or respiratory tract. It also can burn your throat and stomach if you swallow it, um, and it can corrode metal. So examples are toilet boy cleaner and oven cleaner. So these are things that you probably have in your home. I know I do. Uh, so precautions are to do not allow to contact with your skin or clothing. So wear gloves, goggles, face mask, avoiding breathing these products in. If you do in contact, come in contact with the product, rinse with lots of water immediately and keep these containers sealed. These are the sorts of things that you definitely need to keep away from children and pets and vulnerable populations um, because they can be really harmful. All right, our second symbol is flammable. So our image is that we have uh, flames inside of our octagon, diamond, or triangle. So this means that the product or its fumes, so it could just be if you just the fumes of it, which is important to note it, uh, will catch fire easily if it's near heat, flames, or sparks. So it's not like you just have to burn the product directly in order for this to be flammable. It's that it potentially can catch on fire really easily um, if it's just close to heat. So gasoline is one example. So you need to keep it away from heat. Know how to use the fire extinguisher properly. Have have a fire extinguisher bar properly in your home and in your workplace where you know what it is, how to use it. Uh, use the ventilation to keep the fumes from being trapped and store away from heat. Our third symbol is explosive. So we have a image of a probably something that seemed originally was circular and now is exploding out is what our diagram looks like inside of our three different symbols. So the meaning is that it can explode if it is heated or punctured. So flying pieces of metal or plastic can cause serious injuries, especially to the eyes. So if whatever is the substance that is inside the container, if it explodes and there's gonna be projectiles from the container that it exploded, um, it can also corrode metal. I think that's probably a typo from me copying and pasting my slides. My bad, sorry about that. Um, a spray paint in an aerosol container is one example. Probably pretty much anything in an aerosol container is explosive. So precautions, handle it carefully, do not drop or heat it, don't mix it with anything else and have proper storage of, it's important. And then our final hazardous household product is poison. So we have a skeleton, a skull with a crossbones behind it is the symbol for poison. So it could be fatal if swallowed or inhaled. This includes licking, eating, drinking, and sometimes smelling the products could have caused illness as well as death. So windshield wiper fluid and antifreeze are examples. So do not allow contact with skin or clothing. Wear, again, wear gloves, goggles, face masks. Do not breathe in the fumes. Wash your hands after using. Do not ingest these products. If you do, call poison control or 911 immediately. So those are the, the four for the hazardous household product symbols, um, which are probably in things that you have around your home. This second system is the workplace hazardous material information system symbols, which is also known as WIMIS. So women's symbols are used to alert people to hazards and materials used mainly in the workplace. So these ones are more focused on the workplace whereas the last ones were the household ones. Um, if you are, if you work most, pretty much every workplace that I've worked in, I've had to do women's training. So they are part of the Canada's national standard for chemical classification and hazard communication. This standard makes these symbols mandatory on all products containing controlled materials. It also means that material safety data sheets describing the material risk must be provided with every product sale. There are eight women's symbols. Each shows a different icon enclosed by a circle. The icons represent different hazards. The hazards are closed, classed from A to F, depending on the type of hazard. 
so this is again training that most likely in most jobs you are going to have to do at some point and hopefully when you get the job when you are starting in order to understand how to deal with chemicals or hazards in your work environment and how to access information about them so here is a graphic that i found today um, that is we missed symbols from 2015 so a little bit old but also fairly new compared to what is in your workbook because they probably don't change too much there may be things that are slightly different um but this gives us a general idea and usually they're fairly kind of the whole point is that you can uh understand from the image kind of what's going on so the first one is a um a gas cylinder is what is inside of the your your symbol um so the classification is gas under pressure so example of wrists are materials which are normally gas gases can be kept in a pressured container so it may explode if heated punctured or dropped examples of safe handling procedure ensure the container is always secure store in appropriate designated areas do not drop or allow to fall protect from mechanical damage. Our second hazard is flame. So this is meaning that it is flammable, pyrophoric, self-heating, in contact with water, emits flammable gases, self-reactive or organic peroxide are all reasons why you might have a flame on your chemical. So the example of risks are materials which will continue to burn after being exposed to a flame or other ignition source. So may ignite if exposed heat, sparks, friction, flames, or incompatible material. How to safely handle, store in properly designated areas. Keep away from heat, hot surfaces, sparks, open flames, and other ignition sources. Store in a well-ventilated, cool place. Then we have flame over a circle. So this is for oxidizer. So it's like the flame, but we have it on top of a circle. So this is materials that, which can cause other materials to burn or support combustion. So including oxidizing gases, liquid solids, may cause fire or explosion, may enhance the combustion of other materials. Store in areas away from combustibles in well-ventilated cool place. Store in proper containers, which will not rust or oxidize. Keep away from heat, hot surfaces and sparks. Keep valves fittings free from oil and grease. Then our fourth one is an exclamation mark. This one might look a little bit different. It looks different in your workbook. And so there may be things that are slightly different. Um, and this is skin or eye irritant sensitive, skin sensitizer, acute toxic, toxicity, narcotic effects, hazards to those on there. So poisonous materials, which cause immediate and severe harm, avoid breathing dust or vapors, avoid contact with skin or eyes, wear personal protective equipment which is effective for exposure situation working well ventilated areas wash potentially exposed body parts thoroughly after handling then our fifth is health hazard so we have a picture of an outline of a person um, that has a star in their center sort of over their heart indicating that they're kind of breaking up i think and being sick so the classification is Carcinogenicity, sorry, uh, germ cell mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity, respiratory sensitization, specific target organ toxicity, and aspiration hazard. So these risks are materials which can cause or are suspected of causing serious long-term health effects. How to be safe, work in a well-ventilated area, store in appropriate designated areas, avoid direct contact, use personal protective equipment, obtain and learn special instructions, controls before use, avoid repeated and or prolonged exposure situations. Then we have some more which um, aren't exactly, aren't all in the same in your workbook. Um, so we have bio, biohazardous infectious, so which is this, uh, I don't know how to describe this image. A circle with kind of like three crescents uh, overlapping it. So in the uh, risks are infectious agents of or biological toxin causing serious disease or death, may cause anaphylactic shock, 
may include exposure to viruses, yeast, mold, bacteria, and parasites, which may cause disease in animals or humans. So the safe handling is to follow safe laboratory practices and procedures, avoid forming aerosols and breathing vapors, store in special designated areas with limited access and appropriate engineering controls, follow routine practices and universal precautions, such as hand hygiene and glove use. Then we have corrosive, again, which is a slightly different image than in the other, in the hazardous, the household hazard ones. Um, so here we have an image that looks like we have a piece of metal and we have a hand that both have test, test tubes dripping over top of it and then the our little, it looks like a little explosion or that it's corroding away on those surfaces. So it's corrosive to metals, can cause serious eye damage or severe skin burns. Risks, materials which react with metals and living tissue, skin corrosive burns, serious eye damage, corrosive to metals again, and safe handling, use appropriate storage containers and ensure proper non-venting closures, wear per appropriate personal protective equipment, including respiratory protection, because you can breathe it in and it can burn your lungs. Then we have exploding bombs, we have explosives, which again, looks very similar to the other explosives, a bit of a circle kind of bomb thing, and then everything busting out. So this can be described as self-reactive, if it's severe, organic peroxide, if it's severe and explosive. Materials which may explode due to reaction to fire, shock, friction, heat, puncture, or incompatible material. The safe handling is to handle with care, avoiding vibrations, shocks, and sudden temperature changes. Store in appropriate containers. Ensure storage containers are sealed and store and work in designated areas. Then we have our skull and crossbones again, which is acute toxicity, fatal or toxic. Uh, materials which can cause toxicity or death even in small quantities. And safe handling is to avoid breathing fumes and vapors and skin contact. Wear appropriate protective equipment. Work in well ventilated areas. Follow manufacturer's use, handling, storage, and disposal instructions to prevent acute exposure and adverse health effects. So then we have not all hazard classes and categories have pictograms. So there's some things that um, could, that don't necessarily have a picture, but they still have a list of what the problem is. Um, so you just need to read that and you need to make sure that you're reading all the information about it. And then finally, uh, a newer one, it's not mandatory in terms of women's, but there's an environment one where we have the image is a tree and uh, looks like maybe some water with a dead fish in it. So this is aquatic toxicity and may be harmful to aquatic life or cause long lasting effects to the aquatic environment. The safety handling is to use products according to directions, avoid release to the natural environment, dispose in accordance with all regulatory requirements and obligations. So overall, the safety handling from is to wear personal protective equipment, to store things appropriately, to work in ventilated areas, pretty much that, and to follow the rules, follow the routines, make sure that you know the, the precautions and the practices. Um, that kind of sums it all up, no matter what the hazards that you're dealing with, that's, those are all probably good things to do. Okay, so prevention and protection. Accidents happen is what people often say, yet so-called accidents have real causes. Everything has some, comes from somewhere, it's, so what can we do to prevent them? The best way to protect against accidents is to prevent them from occurring, so prevent before dealing with them. Preventing accidents requires forethought, planning, and protection. The three best points at which to do this are at the hazard source, along the path to the worker, and at the worker by using safety equipment. So if we are Preventing accidents at the hazard source, this means eliminating or minimizing the source of hazard, is the best means of preventing accidents. It's also typically the most costly. So an example of control at the source is the use of systems of closed reaction vats in the chemical industry. The vats are used to carry out chemical reactions that may be dangerous or involve toxic or cancer-causing substances. Because the hazards are contained at source, no one is exposed. The reactants and products can also be dealt with in an environmentally responsible manner. Another example of controlling of the source is the use of soundproofing in high noise manufacturing environments. However, both of these are investments that the employer or the industry must do and 
as probably we all know, um, that is not the most profitable way of making money. And so instead of investing in these things that measures that protect people, many companies don't. And it means that the people, the employers, the employees are the people who end up paying with their health um, instead of the employers paying financially to keep them safe. So the second method is along the path. So the path controls are the second be best means of preventing accidents. And they're typically less expensive than source controls. An example is the use of machine guards in the path of saws, cutting tools, and other moving machinery. The guards are placed physically are place physical barriers between the hazards and the workers, and they make it difficult for anyone to get hurt or killed. So here is an example on a bandsaw that leaves only enough space for the saw to be exposed when, when cutting works. So there's a wheel guard around the spinning wheel that powers the saw. There's a blade guard here and a blade guard here so that the blade isn't um, you're not gonna, it's gonna be really difficult to actually get cut. And then there's a wheel guard down here at the bottom. So that just shows some different ways that for one machine, that way that you can protect people along the path while using the, the thing that might, using the hazard. And then finally at the worker by using safety equipment. So personal safety equipment is typically the least costly way to prevent accidents. Such equipment includes protective footwear, gloves, clothing, hearing protection, and five-point harnesses that prevent falls. This also includes safety glasses, face shields, helmets, and air purifying masks, and self-contained breathing apparatus. This equipment is designed to prevent physical injury or to prevent hazardous materials from entering the body. Such materials can get in via ingestion, inhalation, skin absorption, and puncture and wounds. Professional safety equipment is usually dependable. However, it is intended to be used only for short periods and it also does not address the hazard at its source. For this, these reasons, it is considered the least effective way to prevent accidents, but it is probably the one that is most usually used because it is the cheapest for the employer. Um, often things like protective footwear wear, or hearing protection are offloaded to the employee that you have to buy your own steel toe boots or bring your own earmuffs or things like that, or you are given a certain number of air purifying masks and you have to use them for a certain number of period of time and it may not be as effective as uh, ideally. So these costs are pushed, often pushed from the employer to the employer, employee yet again. Okay, so let's consolidate what we have learned today. So lesson 17, the highlights dealing with workplace hazards. So we talked about the biological, chemical, and physical types of hazards. So things to be aware of no matter where you are working. And we talked about how to minimize the risks, particularly understanding the labeling systems that are on all sorts of hazards um, and respecting them. So not only seeing, oh, look, there's a hazard symbol, but knowing what it means and respecting them and acting accordingly to be safe. So these was the hazardous household product symbols where there were those, there are four, um, flammable, explosive, corrosive, and poison. And then the workplace hazardous material information system, which is WMIS, where there was uh, those four, as well as um, a bunch more. Actually, you don't have them all memorized. You don't have to have them memorized. You just need to recognize what they are and make sure that you're safe. And then we talked about prevention and protection so that at the source is the best way to prevent the source of the hazard. If we are able to prevent accidents from happening at the source, that is the best, though it is the most costly. Um, along the path is less expensive and, but also less effective. And at the worker is the least expensive, but also the least effective. Though having a combination of three is probably the best protection for uh, workers. All right, so hopefully with our success criteria, you can describe bi biological, chemical, and physical workplace hazards. And you can explain how to minimize risk both at home and at work. There are review questions for key questions on page 143, question one through 14. So those are where you should check out to see what, um, what work to submit. 
I hope that this was a useful lesson today. Um, again, we are getting close. This is lesson number, I don't even remember in this moment, 17, I think. Um, and we have 23 lessons in total. So we have just another six lessons of new material um, to cover before the June 10th deadline and the end of the term. So please, if you're working on this course, reach out and connect with me. Um, the number at the office is 807-737-1488. My extension is 2209. Or you can also call us toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. My Facebook is B Slate Wassa. So you can connect with me there or you can connect with me through YouTube at B Slate Wassa. Um, where all of our lessons are recorded, have been recorded and uploaded there. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., though I teach the first and the last hour of the day, so that is not a good time to try to get a hold of me. If you miss me, leave me a message or send me an email, um, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I hope you have a lovely day and a lovely long weekend. Remember, we will see you again on Tuesday after the long weekend. Thanks so much for joining me. Mogwetch.